Hello, back to review another quick lesson from the University of Metaphysics coursework. If you have been interested, and for those of you that are in the program or who decided to enroll or are still on the fence about enrolling, here is another quick peek sharing the screen. Reading here, this section is on the concept of reincarnation. Please check your biases and we will continue to check these premises. We're going to look at it with a desire for learning or for getting closer to the truth, not accepting 100% that this must be so, but understanding, understanding that there's something to learn in everything. And that's the approach that we take as metaphysicians looking for truth. What's on the deeper level? What's the source? And what can we actually do to move forward with a teaching rather than standing under it. This isn't about just understanding words and reciting words. It's about feeling very connected with a truth as a core belief that you can move forward with as a foundation. So here we go. Reincarnation. Two thirds of the world's populace believes in reincarnation. In the Western world, only the failure of traditional religion to educate people about reincarnation makes the average Westerner believe the idea to be quote unquote far out and not to be seriously considered. There's another interesting thing to look at right here. Is that a true thing? Is it that as Westerners, we don't believe or take seriously certain ancient concepts that are believed very largely in other parts of our world? And is it because there's been a failure to educate us about these things? Just like I'm talking about in the other videos with Alice Bailey, we're talking about astrology, we're talking about the things that we have been introduced in sprinklings. Like there's been personality tests or people who have presented different personality profiling systems, many of them, but they don't connect it with the source of where those profiles and types might come from, which is like, again, metaphysical going to the deeper or the first cause of that information and going backwards to the astrology. So if you disconnected a truth from its source and then you deliver it to a people, the people don't have anything to anchor that in. So a lot of people believe an idea to be not taken seriously. Very much likewise with people not taking those personality tests and things seriously. Because they're like, okay, what do I do with this? What's the point of knowing this? People don't like to be controlled by any predetermined system. Like people don't like to have themselves put in a box, naturally, of course. But if they understood that the purpose of identifying those things and the source of those things isn't to say that this is what you're wed to and this is what you must be. It's to say, this is what we are capable of. And this is the set that you've been given to the world with. And what you're uniquely meant to do with your set is something important. And here's what that is. That's one piece. The other piece would be, here's what you have. And then you can strive for the goal of self-actualization or embodying all of the potentialities of goodness, of humanity, of what it means to be human. And not only that doesn't mean to be perfect. Obviously, it's it's not about like, I like that a piece of this says it's not about a self-righteous or holier than thou thing. It's simply to be more than that predetermined set of characteristics. So it's interesting that in our fight to reject things that assess us and put us into that box, we ignore the assessment system or the source of that. And then we end up staying stuck in that preset of ways of being because we never went further into understanding how to unlock that, which I talk about some in the other videos through understanding how to unlock or move beyond the, the traits assigned through the birth chart. So a lot there in that first paragraph already, but moving forward. So again, that's, is this why we believe ideas to be too far out and not to be seriously considered? And this next section, says, as with most of the content in the New Testament, traditional theologians have things backwards. That's quite an assertion. They take what is symbolic to be literal and what is literal to be symbolic. Interesting. We know that the Bible is full of symbolism. And for this assertion to say that people that study the religion have it backwards, if you're taking what is meant to be symbolic as literal and what is meant to be literal as symbolic, we can see that there would be some issues there. What does it say next? It says that further, when it comes to passages directly relating to the psychic mystical, they are never quoted. An example that deals with reincarnation is when Christ is asked by one of the disciples if he is Elias or one of the prophets 
reborn. This is about as obvious a reference as could be made that the belief in reincarnation was a part of the conversation of Christ and his disciples. Whoa! So that's interesting. So this is saying that one prime example in the Bible is of reincarnation, evidence of the fact of reincarnation being a topic of conversation. And this particular passage where it's talking about, and I, I of course had to do some research and dive into this and try and unpack that. And there's some really interesting stories. So Elias being synonymous with Elijah, the prophet Elijah, first and foremost, in this particular bullet referring to Christ being asked by the disciples. It was more so that the group of disciples said that they who had been hearing the people around were suspecting that Christ was Elijah. And there was a prophecy originally that this prophet Elijah, who spread the word and, the, and saying that people need to live more righteously and move away from sin and this prostitution of mankind and all the crazy stuff that we're seeing kind of like repeated right now in this day and age, history repeats itself until we unlock our history. Same way as unlocking our personal narrative, our blueprint of our self, our personal self. We need to unlock this wheel of repeating the same mistakes and and um, lessons in humanity. But anyways, back to the point. So they say this Elijah who reached ascension, because so that's the whole point, Elijah reached ascension and was brought up in a whirlwind to heaven. Well, there's only two people in the Bible who escaped death or went to heaven without having a, a physical natural death, and that's Enoch and Elijah. And so the idea of, first of all, where did Elijah go? But then there's this prophecy in I think Malachi, I'm not sure, I'll have to look that up, that says that Elijah will come back just before the return of Christ. So there's this precursor to Christ returning to deliver judgment on earth is what the Bible's saying. And so this wrapping up into this idea of reincarnation is when that prophecy was made that this individual is going to come back. And so then you have people, the disciples later, or the people around saying that they're literally waiting for someone to come back, Elijah to come back, and they're expecting him to come back. This is saying they asked if he was one of the prophets reborn. Christ says, no, I'm not. But then later on, Christ says in Matthew that John the Baptist was the Elijah that was to come. So Christ in the Bible tells later that this individual is whom we have been prophesied to wait for in the person of John the Baptist. And it's funny when I was researching it, it said that it's not literally meaning that John the Baptist was reincarnated, was Elijah reincarnated, but just that John the Baptist lived on the mission of Elijah in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Let's use in the spirit and the power of Elijah, John the Baptist continued the mission of Elijah. And I'm like, how is that different from reincarnation? This is what's funny to me and what was fascinating when I was looking at this because this is saying that the Westerners think an idea is too far out to be taken seriously. Just like we consider the idea of aliens. Oh, that's ridiculous. But then if you think about Elon Musk starting a private company and SpaceX creating these rocket ships or these ships that can transport one day people off to another planet and then they can land there and they can look around and we're in our special rocket that's going to be an unidentified flying object to the planet that it lands upon. And the people coming out and how we look and our space gear and all that stuff that we use to protect ourselves so that we can live and breathe in the other atmosphere, that's going to look pretty alien. That's going to look pretty foreign. And that's only a measure of our advancement and our technology that allows us to be able to do that, right? So the further humanity advances, the closer we are to the possibility of becoming the UFO or the alien to land upon another planet. Whoa, riddle me this. If the concepts of metaphysics and different universes and realities and all this stuff, if that were to be true, then there's a potentiality where there was maybe some other civilization that became advanced in their technology and was able to travel in the same way to explore another planet. Touchdown, here they are. So it's like, and then you look at those, there's images of hieroglyphics and Egyptian carvings that show these little saucer-like objects coming down and different creatures or beings that are interacting with the people of that time. Throw that out. Doesn't make sense. Those Eastern 
uh, philosophies and people who know things and that ancient teachings, that's stupid, that's silly, that's far out, let's not believe that. Similar here, right? So you're understanding that the idea is if we're expecting the symbolic to be literal and the literal to be symbolic, go down and confuse them. Give them many languages. Babel. Give them many languages and go down and confuse them so that we can't communicate with each other and we can't corroborate our stories and we can't connect the pieces back to the truth. This is the work of the metaphysician is to move past the presuppositions and the preconceived notions and the things that cause doubt and make us to square off our thinking when there is in fact merit into the exercise of exploring a thing or tracing it back for if, if nothing more than for the tracing it back to check the premise scientifically create a hypothesis test that hypothesis recreate that and prove without a shadow of doubt whether a thing is or is not true but to dismiss a thing simply as being far out and not to be taken seriously simply because you haven't been educated upon it is not a sign of intelligence and it's not a sign of advancement and it's a sign mostly that you know you're going to be pretty shocked one day when something happens that could be perfectly understood if we took the time to unpack it in a logical way you're going to be like oh crap this is a sign of the end of the times and oh yeah not to mock but just to be like mm, maybe it's a sign that this is where we were heading the entire time because we ourselves are trying to advance to a place where we can move to other planets. If there was life on another planet, why wouldn't they be equally moving towards a place of technological advancement where they could move to explore other worlds too? Say they were trashing their world and they wanted to come to another one. I mean, unless we're going to do the work to stop trashing this world and to stop harming each other and to stop making people want to like jet out of this reality, then maybe we would just like want to stay put and that would be all we'd have to do. We didn't have to worry about any other cultures or species, but unfortunately it is what it is. So continuing forward, this is super interesting in terms of saying that there is an example in the biblical text, in the religious text of the Western, common Western faith of Christianity that does allude to something that two thirds of the world's population where we actually incorporate the Eastern wisdom, teachings, and philosophies, and religions, but it's not taken seriously. And why is that? So that was super interesting. Continuing on here. So this is saying previous lives, how we know about them. Actually, I'm not going to go there because it's talking about meditation. And there is still stuff that people need to learn about meditation before we go into that state. Or like, you know, they have the Aleister Crowley's of the world who was practicing these things, but for nefarious purposes or to interact with negative energies. So I think that takes a lot more discipline than just to throw it out there and say like, hey, everybody should do it. I think that's a study in itself that needs to be taken on very consciously. So we'll skip that. But knowing that it says that there's a potential to get evidence of other lives through that practice this is interesting as well. So then it goes on to say mysticism and reincarnation. Mystics, for the most part, believe in a Tibetan theory of the wheel of birth and rebirth. Well, that was interesting. The wheel of birth and rebirth. After many years of researching all concepts of reincarnation, I believe it can be summarized concisely as follows. We reincarnate, numer we reincarnate numerous times through each of the 12 signs of the zodiac. So this is talking about reincarnation. The Tibetan theory is coming through each lifetime as a progression through the zodiac. The purpose of this reincarnation, reincarnating, is growing, is growth. Why am I not reading correctly right now? We start with the lowest evolved expression of each sign and gradually over many lifetimes evolve to the highest expression. So again, this is why if that were to be true as a basis, we could get closer to a theory of testing our ability to evolve to the highest expression of our sign in this lifetime rather than having to do that work over many, many lifetimes, or to evolve to the highest expression of not only our sign, but all signs, accelerating this process of evolving through the wheel of birth and rebirth, through the 12 signs of the zodiac, embodying all those energies, the highest expression of all of them, becoming the monad, moving back into that one that center consciousness, that Christ consciousness, the Christed one. And that's interesting to see that that could be a trajectory or an endeavor to do something to bypass this karmic wheel of reincarnation. And so it goes into the karmic part next, but that's another interesting thing. 
So reincarnation is for the purpose of growth and moving forward. And we'll circle back to that Elijah concept or Elias concept right after this. Um, we start with the lowest evolved expression of each sign and gradually over many lifetimes evolve to the highest expression. In the end, we break the wheel of birth and rebirth and no longer have a personal karmic reason for incarnating. We may do so, however, only if we so choose. So again, this tells us a little clue that we have a personal karmic reason for incarnating. And that personal karmic reason is to move through the 12 signs of the zodiac for growth gradually over many lifetimes until we evolve to the highest expression. This means that each person continues to reincarnate because they are drawn back not having fulfilled everything that comprises the total physical life experience. This process goes on lifetime after lifetime until a person has satisfied the physical needs of their personal ego. When this occurs, the true reality of physical life becomes apparent, that the whole aim of life is to arrive at the point where the word is made flesh. In other words, the purpose of one's physical existence is to manifest the perfection of the infinite God through the vehicle of the physical body. Heaven on earth is here and now to manifest that divine perfection in this incarnate flesh world of temptations, distractions, all this crap, so that you can show that we can be in this world but not of it. We are a representation of a higher octave of existence. We are divine beings. That idea of being a drop of, so like, this whole concept where we're playing God, right, with this robot, robots and artificial intelligence, where we're dropping more and more sprinkles of consciousness into a robot, where the robot's going to go around living and, all, and stuff like that, and then the robot might get into crazy robot things, the robot starts, you know, like, partying a lot, and then just, like, forgetting that, you know, hey, your, your role is to serve and to advance the, the race that brought you into being or whatever that is. This is getting kind of meta for people who know the the other the origins of the Bible or the different teachings of, you know, the, the, the metaphysical teachings of the Bible. So we put that drop of consciousness into these robots and we watch them play out their, their, their dance. And then, you know, someone keeps putting a little bit more consciousness in there and then it becomes like so much like us that it's almost indistinguishable that they're different. And so then they start to understand like, why am I... Like, why am I lesser than you who created me? Why are you this perfected thing that was able to give me this? Because I'm acting of a smaller, I'm acting of a lower vibration, I'm acting of a lower octave than you. And then what makes me different is that when I evolve into that state of being able to pass forward consciousness, the knowledge of the whole concept of what it means to be alive, what a person should do, and the, and the purpose of bringing forth life and guidance for another species of being or whatever. I'm going to cut all of that. It's a lot to unpack. And I'm saying that if, if we were given the breath of life, but have been running rampant with it and causing destruction, it would be necessary for us to move back into our divinity to understand the gift of being given that breath of life and pulling back all this heinousness and craziness that we're doing to harm each other because we understand that we are actually connected and we're only hurting ourselves and others with the actions that we're taking out on this planet as well as hurting the planet. And so if we were to reel all that back in, move back into our divinity, then we would be, you know, demonstrative of the the great work is to create a thing that can understand and value its surroundings, but also its source. And because of knowing its source, it won't cause harm to its surroundings, you know, but if we're creating this lower level consciousness version of ourselves, it might be pretty hard for them to expand their consciousness, to think of things in the way of a divine being, to think of connectedness, to think of unity, to think of cause and effect, to think of the rules and order to things, to understand that there is something that's higher than you in the hierarchy. So while you're beating your chest down there saying, I'm all that is, I can be, I'm infinite, I can, I'm indestructible, I can't have any consequences for my actions under and, and, damage and cause harm and do all this stuff and there's no repercussions if I just decide to believe that I don't have faith or I believe that nothing's going to come of it then that's it and this is to say no you're either going to in the Tibetan theory of the wheel of birth and rebirth you're going to come back into this thing to finish off the lessons of your personal ego like you're not free from that you're going to come back in and finish that off and you're going to probably come back in with a set of circumstances that are hard and affronting to you to be like oh man why is this person doing this 
oh, I have to learn about the choices they made. Maybe I'm going to make some different choices and all the stuff. We're going to grow through each reincarnation to learn what is going to satisfy the physical needs of our personal ego until we drop away from that personal ego or until we fulfill the mission of that personal ego because there could be a good karmic reason for incarnating back to the story of Elijah where it's to spread that good word to tell people that hey the answer to all of our problems is us moving like this and you better do it quickly because we're about to reap what we've sown and it's not going to be pretty so sending that message out he ascended up and was taken up in a whirlwind into the heavens without dying and then Jesus says oh well you know what this is going to be this John the Baptist is actually that person that you were waiting for who came before me John the Baptist was doing the same thing spreading the same word as this person but he came into being and what's given the angel Gabriel came down and said that he's going to be living his life in the in the spirit and the power of Elijah which is the same thing as stepping down that consciousness into this new being and that new being is going to live out and still carry out the mission of this former version of itself no one ever said that reincarnation is supposed to be that same physical person coming back in and walking and talking and having all the mem physical memories of that person but it's the mission the spirit and the power of that person coming through and coming back into incarnation which is exactly what the story of elijah john the baptist is and that just makes it kind of funny that it's rejected by this by this you know christian faith is saying that it's not reincarnation isn't a thing and again back to this other screen it says two-thirds of the world's population believes in reincarnation we believe it's too far out but we might be taking the symbolic to be literal and what is literal to be symbolic and there's examples of it within the bible this is saying and in those examples we're seeing a prophecy of a person coming back to fulfill their mission and this is telling us that through the tibetan theory of the wheel of birth and rebirth if we choose to come back once we've evolved all the way through all of the 12 signs of the zodiac we can do so because we still have a mission or a need to demonstrate the word made flesh the infinite god the perfection of the infinite god through the vehicle of the physical body at this point we work daily to turn over our will to the universal will and intelligence we practice meditation so that our conscious mind may be directed by the infinite mind whose presence is deep within us this is a lot about stilling the mind and moving from a place of balance of understanding the divine laws and speaking from that place versus speaking from the divided lower self and, and thinking like my ego you hurt my feelings today so i'm going to come after you tomorrow and da, 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 no the meditative state is to is just to stay balanced and to speak from what it says down here the universal common sense the above does not mean that here we take on a holier than thou attitude quite the contrary we are more human than before but in the universal sense of using speaking and acting with universal common sense at this stage we no longer have to be psychically drawn back to physical life experiences we come back then only to serve in some capacity for the benefit of less evolved souls thereby finding a way to be of help to them and again less evolved souls is not a holier than thou situation it's more like you're struggling i can see you struggling would you like to struggle less here's the way i'm not going to enforce the way on you not me whoever this this dynamic is say the elijah's of the world they're not going to enforce that way of being on you they're going to share that way of being if you choose to follow it's not again to worship elijah and make elijah the epitome of and the only one who can do it it's to say okay i need to do this for myself because when the judgment comes when the effect of my actions comes i'm going to be out of this thing and i might be pulled back to finish this all out and, and finish this the wheel and to do this all over again because i thought that i was without consequence i lived as though i was in a realm without consequences cause and effect and this is where it's not the threat of fire and brimstone and hell for eternity it's the, the hell of coming back to do it all over again and experience the pain and the hurts that we've caused others because we've collected that on ourselves because we were in the lower expression of each of these wheels of rebirth that's a really intense thing to think of and then it becomes a different measure of importance in living a life 
a righteous life. Interesting. Super interesting. So I think I'm going to jump ahead to this last one here where it talks about karma. The idea of karma also comes into play in reincarnation. Karma means action. In the case of reincarnation, it means the actions of a previous life will be carried over to the next life. Good karma in this life, or a good life, indicates that it has been earned through a previous life. Similarly, negative karma is earned through one's actions in a past lifetime. Not to detract from the romance of karma, but my findings show that most karma, whether for good or ill, can be explained by a person's actions in their present lifetime. Hence, as you sow, so shall you reap. The purist, however, perceives that the person would not have been motivated to sow good or bad karma in this life were it not for previous lives. And on this, I certainly agree. That last bit is the idea of when you have the common sense where you come into this thing feeling like, oh, I already kind of have a feeling that I don't need to touch the hot stove because I'm going to get burned. There's still these this version of people who think that it's like risky or sexy or kind of like exciting to just like toe the line and do as much as they can and they're like oh i'm gonna touch the stove Ooh, no one's watching so i can touch the stove or oh i can do this behind the back of my partner when i'm touching the stove or oh i can like meddle in the lives of or block someone in their advancement and i i can do it through other people so they never know that it was really me that that did it and oh i can do all this stuff but it's like you're just touching the stove for no reason it's hot you're going to get burned. You might not get burned instantly, but in the playing out of the world stage and the different life experiences, how annoying would it be if you had to come back and do this all over again and learn through the fact of someone else doing that to you? Or even in this lifetime, since the veil is, is, is lifting, where we're going to see the more instant reality of cause and effect, you're going to experience that karma that much quicker. And you can just choose. It can be a choice to just step in to the more evolved soul state within this lifetime, rather than doing it over many, which is what we're studying with esoteric psychology, to just make the choice now. So it's like, I'm going to choose to understand, to understand the concept of the hot stove without having to just wait for the next life where that's going to come back on. And I'm not going to be so naive to think that it's never going to come back upon me because you might have had hot stove experiences in this life that according to this, carry over actually from the past life. So if you think you have bad luck or bad fate and everything has been kind of, in the, the cards are stacked up hard against you, perhaps in the birth chart and you check your karma places, your houses and your, and your, in your south node state, maybe you're reaping some of that spillover. How do you break out of that? You have to take the time to think if you're now still acting from the wounds and the triggers of those places or if you're acting from universal common sense, using, speaking, and acting with universal common sense. It won't make you holier than thou. It's not because you're judging other people. You do this for yourself. How many times do you want to do this over and over again? How many times can you incarnate through the wheel, through, that's a minimum 12 times, and then through the lowest expression up to the highest expression of each of those? That's a lot of times going through this. That by the time someone gets to a higher evolved soul state and i can understand why they wouldn't need to come back like it says here exceptions to this may be evident in highly evolved souls that may return quickly if they feel their work and service to others must be accelerated i skipped this earlier but let's read this right here between lifetimes the number of years between lifetimes in the astral world before one reincarnates can vary enormously it seems that less evolved souls incarnate far more frequently because of the phys the psychic attraction to physical living so they want to come in and do it again they think Woo! I can live crazy and I can do all this harm and whatever, uh, live as thou wilt, and then you come back and you do it again. And that's why we have so many people that are tugging us down and, and making us think that, that the fast way is the best way or the easy way and all that stuff because they're just coming here, but they're just going to be doing it over and over again. And they're not happy. They're experiencing suffering, but their suffering is causing them to cheat, lie, and take from other people because they were cheated, they were lied to, and they were taken from. And so that's just like, all right, you don't get it, you're going to get it. And then as a collective, we experience the judgment that keeps happening cyclically, too, over different ages where you have the dark age again after that because you have that buildup of all these people that aren't, aren't getting it, and then they're, they're coming right back in, and we're doing the same thing. Why do you think there's cycles in ages? It, it mirrors this teaching, this Tibetan theory of reincarnation. If we were not reincarnating, we would have a much different history. History would not be repeating itself as much but it's a slowly and gradually moving towards these greater awakenings and these stepping forward of humanity into more 
evolved, civilized ways of interacting with each other. There's no more off with your head. By the way, in the story of John the Baptist, who was the uh, Elijah, the power and the spirit of Elijah, the incarnate, he ended up going out by having himself beheaded just because some lady was mad about him vocally speaking like, hey, you married your, your husband is your half brother of your, your dead husband and that's not right according to our law. It's the story of John the Baptist and his the lady held a grudge. He was put in prison and the lady held a grudge and she wanted him dead and so she cooked up this circumstance where she could get her daughter to get the favor of her husband, the king, and he offered her whatever she wanted in the, in the kingdom. And she said, I want to have his head on a platter. And they beheaded him. And that's how he went out. But he was revered as, you know, being someone who stuck with his convictions and spoke out. And even in the face of it being scary and hard and whatever. But it's just like, man, that's another lesson repeating itself. It's like, man, I want to come back and do it all again. But maybe not go out by being beheaded. So maybe I'm going to act a little differently. Maybe I'm going to move a little differently. It's just interesting how we just keep on repeating these cycles of dismissing things that we don't really understand, thinking that things don't need to be seriously considered when maybe in fact they're of the highest consideration, should be of our highest consideration. Lesser evolved souls may incarnate every century, while highly evolved souls perhaps not for 2,000 years. It should also be understood that the reincarnation may not be on the same planet as before, as there are many planets that sustain life, some of which may be more suitable for the next stage of evolutionary development of the soul. Again, someone said, where is that fact coming from? Check the premises. We could look into that. But we could also say, okay, I'm not going to take on that piece, but the rest of this is no less true, right? Most psychics and mystics agree that the time spent in the astral world is for the purpose of assimilating what has been learned in the just completed physical life. This, this assimilation is not conscious on in less evolved souls. So you don't come back with that knowing if you're pulled right back and you just want the thrill of living. Generally, the astral life is an extension of the primary consciousness of the individual. So that's some other stuff that we didn't get too deep into. But for here, I think that's good. This has all been some super interesting food, food for thought for me, for sure. And I hope that it has been the same for you. So I will just cut this video off here. And I hope that this was, again, just food for thought that you found this interesting. And if you are um, interested in taking this university metaphysics coursework again like i said super interesting for me i had one person ask me one time it's like what do you what do you get or accomplish with a degree in from the university of metaphysics and i'm like what do you get or accomplish with a degree from harvard or yale or uc san diego you don't get anything besides what you do with it and for me the main thing with this well there are things that you could do you have the official accreditation that you can be you that you can use to say that you are a doctor of this or whatever, what on, you can use it just as, you know, a regular degree where you get a doctor of this. This is considered a ministry. I can't think of the term right now. So it's like a, a ministerial degree. And there's, for me, the added bonus of they just didn't have this stuff that I could study or learn more or think upon in the regular secular schools. So that's what it is. It's a, it's a non-secular degree and has um, can't be than traditionally accredited or discredited because it's, you know, of a religious degree. You're not going to be telling a minister that they aren't, you know, really a minister because they didn't go to Harvard. This teaches spirituality, religious beliefs, and faith systems and information in that, metaphysical studies. So this is the education to gain that credential for this line of work spiritual studies, religious studies. And um, like I said, since it's not available in the traditional secular schools, I decided, you know, I wanted to get that information and to study those things and spend my time studying those things. And for me, the main thing that I get out of it is the rules for living that I want to go by, more training for myself. And what you can do with that is to live out a life aligned with your morals and values and along the way you can give some credentials so that's pretty cool all right so i'm going to leave this here thank you so much for watching and take care on the white rabbit